the Cotswolds, a unique area of southwest England full of gorgeous countryside with the most spectacular views. Oh, look at this. But I would say that I live here. <laughs> this is the life. I'm poet Pam Ayres. Oh, it's so nice to be back. And in this new series, I'm discovering more delights in my lush part of the world. Just look at this. Oh, gosh. I think that's breathtakingly beautiful. You're a genius. I can't <laughs> deny it. <laughs> but this time, I'm heading further afield, too, to discover amazing places. Look, it's awesome, isn't it? Absolutely spectacular. Look at the colours. And fascinating stories just beyond the Cotswolds borders. This is what he actually looked like. Gosh. The only reason it's here is because your ancestors looked after it for 3,000 years. So join me as I make new friends. Well, welcome to Longbeat House. Who are passionate about the places they call home. Come in, darling. It's you know, very inviting. Yeah, you'll like it. I would something. I don't know what that means. You might just recognise a few of them. This is the place I first heard the Beatles. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers. Cheers Mulvern. Today, I visit Longleat House and say good day to its newest and cutest residents. Yes, oh, sweetie, would you like some of that? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> Delicious. At an Oxford botanical garden, I learn about the creepy ways of flesh-eating flora. Oh, crumbs. Digested into a soup. It becomes soup, that's it. Slurped. Yeah. <gasps> Nature is awesome. And I uncover the history of a special landmark in the place where I grew up. We do know that it's the only genuinely ancient hill figure in Britain. All the others are copies of this one. That's extraordinary. For my first trip today, I'm stepping just beyond the Cotswolds to visit one of Britain's great country estates. Nestled between the towns of Warminster and Westbury in the heart of the Wiltshire countryside lies Longleat House. Look at this beautiful facade. It's an absolute classic of Elizabethan architecture, and it just sits in the landscape. It's got over a hundred rooms, and I just can't wait to go and explore the house and the grounds. This magnificent house sits at the center of a 10,000 acre estate, which is best known for its safari park. When it opened in 1966, it was the first of its kind in the world outside Africa. The idea of the park provoked huge protest, and I'm meeting up with Lord Bath to find out why. Hello, Lord Bath. Pam, very nice yes, to meet you. Nice. When the safari park was first mooted, it was quite controversial, wasn't it? The idea of lions in Wiltshire. Well, it was hugely controversial. Mm. Were people frightened? They were frightened. They assumed that the lions would escape and eat people. And yeah. the British being the British, there was a particular uh, concern that they might breed with the domestic cat population oh. and ruin, <laughs> ruin our, our <laughs> pool of pets. That's tubby cats. Yeah. Gosh. In 1966, it cost just one pound to drive through the park. Then, as now, a pride of lions, giraffes and a herd of zebras pulled in the crowds. Jolly good value for a quid. It was a very forward-looking decision by your grandfather, wasn't it? To have the vision to see what it might become. Yeah, it was, uh, very much so. He, um, you know, he was a real entrepreneur can hear an animal calling in the distance. You can. What is it? Uh, that's, that's a sea lion. Oh! Yeah, sorry. yeah. Uh, asking to be fed, I think. Yes. The rationale in 66, you know, remains the same today. You know, unless you're going to, you know, unless you're able to fly to Africa... Yes. Um, ..this is one of the few uh, environments where you can see these animals in wild large enclosures yeah. are running free. 
and Lord Bath's not joking, a portly figure has risen up from the waters. I see something I can hardly believe. Can that be a hippopotamus I see before me? That is a hippo. Let's, let's go, go and have a look. Yeah. have two old spinster Oh, hippos. two old yeah, spinsters yeah, who've never had the ladies. delight of matrimony. They can survive in this climate, but I always imagine them in the waters of the Limpopo or some very, yes. warm, some very warm river. Yeah, they're very happy in this climate. Are they? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. that's really nice to see. Well, with happy hippos like Spot here, Longleat Safari Park and attractions such as Jungle Kingdom bring in nearly a million visitors every year. The park's long been involved in its own conservation work, and Lord Bath is introducing me to some of its newest arrivals all the way from Australia. How did you become involved with protecting koalas? So it would have been... Uh... Back in 2018, a member of our team went out to meet the guys at Cleveland Wildlife Park in Australia, which is a sanctuary for the southern species of koala. And how many koalas do you have here now? So we have two males, two females, uh, and the new Joey Hazel. Baby! Yes, exactly. <laughs> how endangered is the southern koala? So, they are on the endangered species list. Um, koalas face a, a number of health conditions. The intention is that this really becomes a, a, a centre for research into the various conditions that, that koalas face. Yes. Which are very well known in terms of the list of conditions, but very poorly understood in terms of what to do about them. I never realised just how threatened these appealing animals are which means the conservation work here is all the more important. Well, I'm going to stop getting in the way now and see if I can help out one of the keepers. Sam, it's lovely to meet you. You're one of the learned koala ladies. Yes. <laughs> Something like that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> what's, your, what's your daily routine with these animals? So, lots of cleaning, lots of feeding, um, and lots of watching them sleep. They are extremely lazy, so it's, it's quite easy going. <laughs> Well, it sounds a very nice activity. Can I, can I help? Of course you can. We always like help. Um, we're going to go and give them their breakfast, if that's all right. I'd love to, yeah. Lovely. I'll come and help. I'll come and get in the way. <laughs> I'm sure you won't. If we, uh, if we head that way, we'll go and find them. OK. Oh, look, she's so sweet. Look. Should we uh, try and give her some breakfast? Absolutely, yeah. Shall we see if she wants some? Let's have a look. Hello, so Hazel. you can do is you can just sort of... Hold it up and offer it and see. Look, Hazel. If it's going to be good enough. Look. Yeah, you have to put it right up. Look. Right up towards her. Oh, sweetie, there. would you like some of that? Look. It's very nice. Look, sweetie. Come on. Oh, you're a good girl. Oh, oh yes, yeah, she she's like, yeah, oh, like yes, bit. please. <laughs> I'll have some of that. Thank you. Delicious. It isn't every day you get to feed and get close to these marvellous little marsupials, so I've written them a small tribute. There's something awful nice about koalas. They have a lovely eucalyptus pong. They find themselves a eucalyptus arbour and munch the vegetation all day long. You couldn't accurately call them speedy. You'd have to call them ponderous and slow. But there's one thing that's for sure. These are creatures we adore, and we absolutely will not let them go. We know about the fortunes of koalas and hope again in safety they may roam. But comfy at Longleat, they have lots of leaves to eat, and we hope that in time they can go home. It's been a thrill to spend time at the safari park, but there's lots more to see at Longleat. Coming up... Well, welcome to Longleat House. I meet Lady Bath for a private tour in this most palatial of country homes. What an absolutely extraordinary hall. And I discover the chilling secrets of one of nature's deadly traps. Insects are attracted to the sugary nectar. Like saying, come in, darling. It's you know, very inviting. Yeah, you'll like it. <laughs>
welcome back to the Cotswolds and beyond. I'm visiting the beautiful Longleat Estate, which is set in around 10,000 acres of rural Wiltshire. Longleat House is widely considered to be one of the finest examples of Elizabethan architecture in the whole of the UK. And I have a special appointment with the lady of the house. Hello. Hello, Lady Bath. I'm Emma, how are you? I'm well, and I'm so pleased to meet you. Oh, well, welcome to Longleat House. Let's have a look around. Yeah, absolutely, I'd love to. Lady Bath has kindly offered to give me a special tour of her incredible home. What an absolutely extraordinary hall. The front door is behind us, and yes. this is the grand staircase of Longleat House. It's certainly well-named, isn't it? It really is grand. And the thing that strikes me about it is that it doesn't feel intimidating. It feels quite homely and welcoming. So here is the grand saloon. It's one of the major staterooms. So the fourth Marquis did a tour of Italy as was the thing yes, at, yeah, the time. at the time, yeah. And was heavily inspired by Venetian palaces. So the ceilings, the, the ceiling fireplace. is extraordinary. Yeah. Look, look at all the painting. So that's all taken sort of from Venice, really. Is it? Yeah. And also during the war, this was a dormitory. The brief period where the house was not lived in, yeah. girls slept in here, can you imagine? It was a girls' school and hospital. Can you imagine waking up in this room? Yeah, <laughs> I feel surrounded by things of immense value and significance. Mm -hmm. I think the point is it's not a gallery or a museum, it is a living, breathing space. Many esteemed visitors have enjoyed Longleat's charms, including myself. Queen Elizabeth I popped over shortly after it was built in 1573, and more recently our Queen Elizabeth II has stayed too. This is a place designed for entertaining those at the pinnacle of high society. This is the most rich and opulent room I think I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Tell me a bit about it. Well, this is the state dining room. This would be the grandest of the grandest dining rooms possible. And royalty would have been entertained in this room historically. I mean, I can imagine people sitting down and taking their seats and having a sumptuous meal. Tell me, the thing that fascinates me is how on earth can you prepare to be custodian of such a house? Because it seems to me the vast majority of women would have run a mile. <laughs> would have thought, no, I can't begin to, to be responsible for all this. But you seem to take it in your stride. I think just, it's such an inclusive, vibrant place, isn't it? Mm. It's not a frozen, austere museum. It doesn't feel cold. It feels alive, you know, and I think... All of us, we have an amazing team. We all work together on preserving the past and the history, but also looking to the future. From the showpiece dining room to the real engine room of any stately home, the kitchen. It's wonderful to be in this huge kitchen. And the thing I like about it is the height, because mm. I imagine all the people working at the furnace-like heat of this kitchen range, as it must have been. What a great room. I love it, it's fascinating. They were so ingenious and creative and it's just wonderful to be in the space and feel the temperature for sure was intentional. It's quite a hot day and it's nice and cool in I here. I know, it's really cool. Yeah, so you can imagine and when it airy. was hustle and bustle of people creating lots of yummy things to eat. Yes. One of the projects pioneered by Lady Bath is the recreation of old recipes from Longleat's archives and I'm about to try the most famous of them all. Obviously, our palettes have evolved and changed, but I think this recipe, essentially, is quite an important one. It's called the Longleat Cake. We could have a taste. I, I think I we should. like it. I'm trying to do it as elegantly as possible. Well, it's a very <laughs> impre I'm terribly impressed. <laughs> Thank you. Some Thank tea? you very much. Oh, please. Can't have fruit cake without tea. This particular recipe dates back to 1875, and included a very new fangled ingredient called baking powder. I'm going to try the famous long leet cake. Right, I'll join you. Well, Cheers. Mm. <laughs> it's very nice. It's a lot nicer than my mum's that had about three currants in it altogether. It's very, very nice. Thank you. I really like it. 
Few. I'm not just saying that. What a relief. It's nice. I've had a wonderful day. Thank you for the tea, mm. thank you for the cake, and thank you for the lovely welcome. So happy. Come anytime. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I will. <laughs> Well, you really can't fail to be impressed by Longleat. From its wonderful wildlife to the sheer opulence of its stately home, it has to be one of Britain's most remarkable country estates. From the treasures of Longleat, I'm heading back across the Cotswolds in search of something equally renowned the dreaming spires of Oxford. The city's world famous for its prestigious university. However, today I'm visiting a special spot which gets top marks when it comes to impressive gardens. This has been on my doorstep for the whole of my life, really, and I have never been here. But today I'm going to put that right. This is Oxford Botanic Garden, home to over 5,000 species of flowers and plants. Look at this mallow, look at it. It's just sumptuous. Hmm. I've visited a lot of green spaces in my time, but this really is a unique place. Hello, Chris. Hello, Pat. Lovely to meet and you. Lovely to meet you as well. Botanist Dr Chris Thurigood knows pretty much every leaf and petal present in this fabulous four-and-a-half-acre garden. Chris, tell me a little bit about the history of the place. I don't know much about it. Why is it here? Yeah, so the garden was first established as a physic garden pan in which medicinal plants were grown to teach the university's medical students about how plants were important in herbal medicine. You know, plants have, um, have always been very much intertwined with our lives and herbal medicine is still very important. Yes, yeah. Um, but, but it has an interesting history, for sure. The gardens were established over 400 years ago. Ever since then, plants from across the world have been brought here to make this part of Oxfordshire their home. Tell me about some of the early figures connected with the garden, Chris. <laughs> the Botanic Garden has a fascinating history, Pam. The garden's first keeper, um, as he was known, the, the, the plantsman, was a, an eccentric called Jacob Bobart the Elder. Oh, I like the name. <laughs> I like that name. What year was Jacob Bobart the Elder in charge? So, so, so he was around during the 1600s, so in, in, in the 1640s, he actually kept a catalogue, so we know exactly what was grown here in the 1600s. Gosh, good old Jacob. <laughs> Is that a salvia? It's related to a, to a salvia. Right. Yeah. No, no, sorry, you're right. That's a salvia nemorosa. That is right. Oh. Yeah, salvia, yeah. Well, I wasn't trying to be a no all. No, I'm no, just in, <laughs> I'm interested in salvia. No, you, 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 uh, <laughs> you were right, and I was wrong there. Oh, Chris, this is such a beautiful herbaceous border. It's such a skill, isn't it, to blend the right things. Now, do you make those decisions? No, not so much, no. The, the credit there goes to our team of horticulturalists, and they're very talented, and they do a wonderful job, particularly of this herbaceous border. People, people come from far and wide just to see it. It's the most beautiful garden, peaceful and colourful and fragrant, and it's in the middle of a city. I know, it's a, like a little oasis in the city, isn't it? Well, it's quite a big oasis, <laughs> really. <laughs> do people come in their lunch hour and eat their sandwiches? They do, they do indeed, Yeah, I um, would. And, and, and I think people come here just to be among plants. It's still true today, really, isn't it, that people come and are soothed and healed by gardens? Very much so. Today, people come to botanic gardens like ours um, for their mental health and well-being, because we know that green spaces are so important for that. This incredible garden even produces 25 botanical plants to infuse in its own Oxford Physic gin. Well, I haven't been offered any yet, but 
I live in hope. Well, Chris, I can't tell you how much I love this garden. It's historic. It's full of lovely horticultural treasures. I'm so impressed. Thank you, Pam. It's a, it's a very special place. But yeah. there's one more thing I'd like to show you. Oh, good. Oh, <laughs> good. It's not over yet, then. Good. <laughs> Off we go. Oh, crumbs. Chris has taken me into one of the garden's jungle-like hothouses. And one particular group of plants makes me feel very uneasy. Look at now, then. Now, this looks sinister. This is a pitcher plant, yeah, I think. Yeah, that's right. This is a, a carnivorous pitcher plant. Apparently. Right. Um, so this... Oh, it looks carnivorous, doesn't it? <laughs> it's it looks menacing, isn't it? Tell me how it actually works. So this is a beautiful but deadly trap. Insects are attracted to the sugary nectar that it produces under here. Right. And the insect lands on this part. And I don't know if you want to touch it. It's slippery in one direction. It's rough in the other. That feels so smooth. That yeah. It's like saying, come in, darling. It's you know, very inviting. Yeah, you'll like it. <laughs> they fall into a pool oh. of... <laughs> digestive <laughs> fluid. I didn't get you to that. Oh, God. No, I didn't. <laughs> and it breaks down the insects, and then the insect's remains nourish the plant. Digested into a soup. It becomes soup, and that's it. Slurped. Yeah. <gasps> I mean, nature is awesome, isn't it, <laughs> to produce something like that? It's a I mean, feat look. of botanical engineering, I think, yeah. isn't it? It's quite something. Well, these flesh eaters are certainly fascinating, but I think I'll stick to the more friendly ones back outside. Oxford Botanic Garden really is a paradise for plant lovers. I've enjoyed every single minute of my visit here, and I'm sure I'll be back again soon. Coming up... I revisit my childhood playground and learn the history behind Britain's oldest chalk hill figure. What I would like to know is why it was built because it's supposed to be a horse, but it appears to have a kind of beak, and it can only be fully seen from the air. And we meet another horsey hero, newly retired from royal duties. Storm would have pulled the Queen's gold carriage for lots of state occasions. He's a pretty special horse. I'm continuing my journey beyond the Cotswolds border to a place I know very well. Set in the heart of beautiful rolling countryside in the wilds of Oxfordshire, I'm heading to the village of Uffington. Now, this is an absolute classic trip down memory lane for me because this is where my dad was born in this cottage. My granny and grandpa lived here. And when we'd come for a day out, we didn't have any money, so we used to come on our bikes. And I loved coming here. And they had a loo halfway up the garden path. The ivy grew into it, so it was like a combined lavatory and garden. And as a backdrop to all this, overlooking the village was a wonderful thing called the Uffington White Horse. This world-famous landmark formed the backdrop to my childhood. The magnificent ancient white horse is very special indeed to me. I've climbed this hill countless times, and it's a place I'm extremely fond of. If I look at this valley over, over behind me, I see so much which is important to me. I see Uffington, where my dad was born, Borkin, where my mum was born, Stamford in the Vale, where I was born, and Whitehorse Hills, extra special to me. I used to come up here and do some courting with my boyfriend and uh, note the plural there, not just the one. And when people say to me, where does that weird accent of yours come from? It's from this valley, and um, I'm very pleased to say that. This extraordinary white horse has a history which goes back further than I thought. But the exact age of the figure and the reason why it was carved here at this spot 
remains a mystery. After more than 70 years of visiting here, I still don't know the answer, but I'm meeting a man who I hope can tell me more. Hello, David. Hello, Pam. It's very nice to meet you. Yeah, it is. It's very and nice the, to meet you, too. And the lark is singing. And the lark is singing to, uh, to your song. arrival. <laughs> yeah, yes. That's right. Perhaps archaeologist David Miles can unpick the mystery of Uffington's horsey history. What I would like to know is why it was built, because it's supposed to be a horse, but it appears to have a kind of beak, and it can only be fully seen from the air. So why was it built, and when was it built, please? <laughs> yeah, well, archaeologists have been arguing about that for about 200 years. Oh. We do know that it's the only genuinely ancient hill figure in Britain. All the others are copies of this one. Oh, really? Because oh. it occurs, it's mentioned in Anglo-Saxon documents. Anyway, when we started to work here, a new type of dating appeared. Oh. This dates the time that crystals like quartz or feldspar last saw the sun. That's extraordinary. Uh, and that put the date even earlier than the time of Christ. It put it even earlier than the Parthenon. In fact, about 400 years earlier than the Parthenon, say roughly around about 800 BC. So we now think that it was built at what is the end of the Bronze Age and the beginning of the Iron Age. The theory we have as to why it was built is that the religion was based on the worship of the sun. Yeah. I think that what they were doing was seeing this horse as the animal that pulled the sun oh, through the sky. That is a really lovely theory. Yeah. I like, I'm going to adopt that. My dad used to tell me stories about how teams of people used to come up here to scour the white horse. They protected the crushed chalk from the ravages of time, trimming back the long grass and keeping tall weeds at bay. Hello. Hi there. Hi there. Hi. Looking good. I'm meeting up with Ranger Andrew Foley, who, with his team of volunteers, looks after the white horse. What are they doing exactly to this outline of my beautiful horse? <laughs> it feels like mine. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> what they're doing, they're busy just clearing away vegetation that grows over the chalk figure over, over a period of time, uh, maintaining the edges and, and keeping it nice, if you like. They're making their way over towards the eye, aren't they? Yeah. I, I remember the eye being a lot bigger because we all used to stand in it and make a wish when we were kids. But I understand it has a, a more um, salty uh, verse attached to it. Please, me being a poet, of course, I've got to hear it. Come on. OK, well, as I heard it, it was, uh, should a maiden stand in the eye of the horse, within one full year she will be with child. Wow. There you go. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. I would never have stood in it if I'd known. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not the only tall tale associated with this place. I was always told that St George, patron saint of England, famously killed the dragon here. You being an archaeologist, you'd probably know that St George didn't kill the dragon there at all. No, I think he lived uh, somewhere else. He was, he was in the Middle East. <laughs> oh, was he? Yes. Oh, I think, I think the other, other end of the Mediterranean, I think. <laughs> Oh, not just Uffington, In Ethi then. Ethiopia. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, and Uffington. To me, this whole area is about my family and the folklore that the country people would talk about. But to talk to you, David, and to have it all put into its proper historical and archaeological setting has been really interesting, so thank you very much. You're welcome. But I think it's all about stories, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think it is. Yeah. Well, it's not just this horsey hill that's played a big part in my life. I've had a love of the real thing since I was just a little girl. And in the middle of the Buckinghamshire countryside near the market town of Princess Risborough sits a place that I think is truly remarkable. The Horse Trust has been providing a rest home for working geldings and mares of all shapes and sizes for over 130 years. It's 
storm's looking pretty good today. It looks very comfortable. Vet Nikki Housby Skeggs is giving one of the Trust's most famous residents a thorough checkup. Storm is one of the Windsor Greys, so he would have pulled the Queen's gold carriage for lots of state occasions, so uh, state opening parliament, uh, Queen's birthday parade. He did the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge's uh, wedding and the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's. So uh, he's a pretty special horse. Storm's definitely a star, but at 20, he's now enjoying his retirement from the regal spotlight. Good boy. Excellent. The Trust's newest resident is getting the five-star treatment. Storm has put on a few pounds, um, but actually he's not too bad, but we will keep a bit of an eye on that over the summer. Storm is one of almost 150 horses living their best life thanks to the Trust. Jeanette Allen is the current boss of the charity, which was launched after its Victorian creator read the story of a very famous horse. Our founder had actually read the novel Black Beauty and was completely bowled over by it. And it inspired her to get some wealthy friends together and create a place where cab horses generally could come, have a rest. And whilst that may seem totally normal to us in modern society, in Victorian times, horses especially were vehicles. They were engines. They did a job. The vital work of the Trust became even more important during the First World War, as tens of thousands of horses were drafted into the British Army to help the Allied forces. At the beginning of the war, the only way to get an injured horse from the front back to a veterinary station was with a horse-drawn horse ambulance which you can imagine took forever and went over bumps and the horse driving, that, that could end up injured as well. And we actually came up with the first ever motorised horse ambulance and sent it over to France. And then at the end of the war, lots of horses did come back here and that's where our real bonding with, with the army started. These horses have, you know, they've given so much to us. If you think, you know, the military horse has all these beautiful parades and sort of what that does for the image of the country. To be able to kind of see them when they finish that work and come and retire to us and just make sure that, you know, that retirement is everything that you'd want for them. You know, see them grow old gracefully is really special. Coming up... I get into the spirit of things concocting my own glorious Cotswold gin. I would su suggest that you start with a generous amount of the base. Let's say 350 really? milliliters. Yeah. Good grief. And I dedicate a poem to one of the places very dear to my heart. I choose the beauty of the Vale, sharp, timeless and enduring. Welcome back to the Cotswolds and beyond. My final trip takes me out into the heart of the beautiful Oxfordshire countryside. I'm heading north across the Cotswolds to find a very special farm near the picturesque town of Chipping Norton. This area is full of prime farmland, but it's not food I'm on the trail of today. It's one of my favorite drinks. I don't drink a lot of alcohol but I do like a gin and tonic, a good one. My friend Frida, she takes a slice of lemon around the top, so it's really sort of sharp and refreshing, and I love it. And you might not think, though, that the journey to that perfect, refreshing glass of g and could start in a field of grain like this one. Over 300 acres here have now been sown with ancient heritage grains to produce organic gin. These hardy crops not only make sensational spirits, but more importantly, are helping the environment too. Hello, David. For the first time. Lovely to meet you. <laughs> what a wonderful field. It's taller than I am. The boss of Oxford artisan distillery, Dave Smith, 
is here to tell me how they turn these eco-friendly crops into a tasty tipple. This is a field of heritage grain rye. And these fields, unlike most cereal fields, act as a life raft for biodiversity. So the idea is that you plant, yeah. you walk away, let nature do its work. Right. So Gosh. no pesticides, no insecticides, no herbicides, no fungicides. It's lovely. It's lovely and strokeable, isn't it? Nice and whiskery. It is. Does it impart special flavours and qualities to the spirits you produce? We absolutely believe it does. <laughs> uh, we think heritage grain adds a lot of flavour to our, uh, our, our spirits. And really, the proof is in the pudding. So the most important thing we can do now is head to the distillery and have a little drink. Well, I could be persuaded. <laughs> Uplifted by the prospect of a g and I'm heading back into Oxford. I'd better go study there, as it's a bit early in the day for me. I might fall over. Look, this look is at the, this. Yeah. This is a distillery. Master distiller Francisco Rosso, or Chico to all his pals here, is the gin genius. Chico, I'm looking at this extraordinary equipment and I have never seen anything like it in my life. And it's a lovely smell coming from it, but what on earth is going on here? Would you tell me, please? The grain that we saw earlier on in the fields, yeah. Um, yeah. and uh, that grain fermented, uh, it has alcohol, and what we're doing right now is uh, distilling the first uh, spirit to then produce our gin. These two stills can hold nearly 3,000 litres. That's over 16 bathtubs of gin. So you wouldn't want to pull the plug out then. Chico, how long does the process take? From the moment that we get the grain in, yeah. we cook the grain, ferment, then distill, and then distill the gin, um, it will take around one month. We develop all the gin recipes with the, the exact balance of flavours to be enjoyed in our different gins. And that's in your laboratory? Yes. Oh, it's a very unique, uh, unique room. Shall we have a look? Yeah, I'd love to have a look. Thank you. <laughs> Chico grew up as part of a winemaking family in Portugal. Oh, my goodness. Oh, a lovely smell. He's had many years of training and he goes on developing his skills in this laboratory of liquor. What have we here? So what we're just about to do is we are creating a bespoke gin. We have two different uh, bases. One is herbal, one is citrus, and then we have several different, uh, one botanical spirits, and you can blend as you wish. OK, so I'm going to choose a base then, either herbal or citrus. I, I like herb, so can I choose the herbal one? Yep. OK. So I would suggest that you start with a generous amount of the base. Thanks. Let's say 350 really? litres. Yeah. Good grief. OK. <laughs> right, I don't want to spill it, eh? It's precious stuff. Beautiful. Can I put some rosemary yeah. in? OK. Yeah, rosemary really works well with, with juniper. Oh, it smells, it smells beautifully of rosemary. Well, I quite like that smell, so I'm going to add about 100 ml. That sounds that good, all right? if okay. you like rosemary. Well, I'm enjoying this. This is going to be a potent mix. Oh, yeah. So, um, I think perhaps I'll introduce another element, me being a creative sort of person. Yes. So I might have coriander sounds nice. Would that yeah. work, do you think? Definitely. Sounds very good. Yeah, I'm just going to put a little bit of coriander in, because I'm not so sure about that one. Now, I have crafted my gin. What shall I do now? Not just swig it in an irreverent fashion. Um, so shall we, we test the, the gin with, uh, with some tonic? I think that's a very good idea, with quite a lot of tonic, I think. <laughs> yeah, 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 let's okay. head to the bar then. OK, shall I bring it with me? I'm going to yes. bring it, my okay. booty with me. It's time to taste the fruits of my labour and discover whether, like Chico, I've got what it takes to be a distiller. I'm 
Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I can't stand the tension. This is a new experience for me to try a gin that I have mixed myself and designed myself. So, um, cheers. Cheers. Cheers to you. <laughs> well, I think it's very nice for a first attempt. It's delicious. The more of it you drink, the nicer it gets. <laughs> now I'll try a bit more. Well, I mustn't drink too much, although it's mighty Moorish. But I'm happy to rate a glass to Chico and the team here for their enterprise in creating this Cotswold success story. From wild creatures at Longleat to ferocious plants in Oxford, it's been a fascinating adventure around the Cotswolds and its borders. But few places in the world are as special to me as Uffington and its famous White Horse. It's very hard for me to express how I feel about this place, but I'm going to give it my best try anyway. I want to go where harebells blow, where birds of prey are soaring, to stand my ground on the castle mound when winter winds are roaring. The fall and sweep of the manger steep, short grass the sheep have nibbled, to feel the chill on Dragon Hill, see where the blood has dribbled. This vale is mine, its name's divine, from Kingston Lyle to Goosey. I learned them all when I was small, from Shellingford to Pusey. But Uffington, ah, she's the one, the chalk and thatch and steeple, Bill and George at Packers Forge, my own familiar people. Some people long for mountains strong or coastal scenes alluring. I choose the beauty of the Vale, sharp, timeless and enduring. Next time, I enjoy the beauty of one of Britain's most amazing gardens. What a wonderful mixture of textures and different shades of green. It's quite breathtaking. I savour Cheddar's gorgeous gorge. I have to say this has surpassed my expectations by a mile. And discover what it's like to live in an ancient home in what's thought to be Europe's oldest street. They have all the mod cons. Oh, we have inside toilets and <laughs> bathrooms. <laughs> earlier time of eight. Glenn Close and Terence Stamp star in our murder mystery this weekend. Don't miss Agatha Christie's Crooked House Sunday at 3.40. And tonight we have a movie icon in the spotlight as we celebrate the best of Julia Roberts, a Hollywood fairy tale. Brandy next. <laughs>